Uh, James, I'll probably just hang out for a little while. So if I leave, it's not anything you said. I didn't run you off then. No. no. Good. Would you like a chair? Yeah, I'm fine. Lord. Okay. Since we're together, I'm going to show the books I'm using again, just so you kind of have an idea of what I'm doing. Uh, for those that are joining us now, this is the Wednesday evening small group. Uh, we've been doing comparative religious, re comparative religions for the last eight or nine weeks, looking at different world religions and how they relate to Christianity. Uh, what I have been using predominantly is this book, which is called The Indispensable Guide to Practically Everything, World Religions and What People Believe. And it's been my primary source. Um, this actually came from, I'm pretty sure I got it from Lifeway about eight or nine years ago. And then as a secondary source, this one came from, um, I think, Mardell's Handbook of World Religions. And then this one is my third source is called, So What's the Difference? And it kind of dives into, well, the other two also talks about the beliefs of each of the religious religions. This one goes more into what difference is it between them and Christianity. Uh, so all three of them together is where I get the information. And as I've said before, I'm no expert on any of these. Uh, I'm telling you what I have learned. And if you know things that I have missed, please feel free, since we're in live, to speak up and tell me. Or if you're not in live, put a comment at the bottom of the, the list and tell us about it. So far, we have looked at Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Mormonism, and Wicca. I think that's all of them. Six. Today we're going to look at Seventh-day Adventist. Next week we look at Church of Christ Scientist or Christian Science. Then we have Jehovah's Witness, Scientology, and New Age, I think, are the last ones we've got. So we're about a little over halfway through with the study comparative religions. So kind of think about what's next. In another couple of weeks, I'll be sending out a list of some possibilities for what we might want to do next uh, to get us through to the end of May, which is the normal time that Wednesday night activities would dispense. So we'll see how that works. So take my glasses off where I can read my notes. I'm nearsighted. I can, I can see you, kind of blurry, but I can't see my notes if I'm wearing my glasses. So Seventh-day Adventist. So a little background about Seventh-day Adventist. The beginning of the Adventist movement, and I use that term to encompass a whole bunch of different religious groups, because Seventh-day Adventist are just the ones that we've heard the most of. But in the middle part of the 1800s, about 1840, 1845, there was a Baptist minister by the name of William Miller who had quite a following. And the reason he had quite a following is one of his primary um, tenets of his preaching was about the return of Jesus Christ, the advent of Jesus. And this would have been the second advent of Jesus. In fact, he prophesied, predicted to his followers that Jesus would return in person, in body, on October the 22nd, 1844. Yeah, it didn't happen. He really disappointed a whole lot of his followers. So they all began to splinter and move away from him, and he kind of lost his appeal. Because prophets who predict things that don't happen kind of lose their credibility. So he lost his credibility. However, some of the groups, some of the people groups that were followers of his teachings decided, you know, let's find out why he was wrong. So they began to dig into the scriptures individually and in small groups looking to find out where William Miller had gone wrong with his prediction. And one of the doctrines that they looked at in addition to the advent was the biblical definition of what the day of rest was. And that's kind of where the seventh day in Adventist comes from. And I'll talk more about that later. Uh, the a biggest group that came out of this look at the scripture, the scripture studies, became the Seventh-day Adventist. And when it was originally founded as a group, 
they viewed it, the mainstream Christianity viewed it as a cult. And the major reason they viewed it as a cult was because it denied the Trinity. As time's gone on, they have rethought their doctrine of the Trinity. And today, if you look at a listing of, quote, mainstream Christianity, you may find Seventh-day Adventists listed because they have kind of moved closer into what mainline Christianity believes, although some of their beliefs are still kind of off in left field. Mm -hmm. Seventh-day Adventists have what they call their 28 foundational beliefs, and it's kind of what their religion is based on. I'm not going to list all 28 of them. As we go through and talk about what they believe about God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, afterlife, worship, and so forth, uh, I'll mention which ones are foundational beliefs, but they have 28 beliefs or tenets that they uh, believe make up their religion. Probably the one that most people know about is the fact that they worship on Saturday. Again, that's the seventh day part of the Adventist. So it's worship on Saturday, we're looking for the advent of Christ coming back. That's kind of where the Seventh-day Adventist name comes from. Today, you can find Seventh-day Adventist churches in over 200 countries around the world. And their membership is estimated to be something over 18 million worldwide. And one source said that it is one of the fastest growing religious groups in the world. So, a little background on who they are. So let's talk about the history and founder of Seventh-day Adventist. I said they broke out because William Miller's prediction of Christ's return didn't happen. Well, reason that he predicted October the 22nd, 1844, is because, according to his believers, his followers, he misinterpreted a scripture in Daniel chapter 8, verses 13 through 14. And I'm sorry, I didn't bring my Bible. I forgot it today. Has anybody got a Bible they can get to real quick? To, to, oh, good. Thank Daniel. you, Esther. Online. Daniel 8, 13 to 17 was the scripture he used to come up with that date. And I kind of remember what it says, but I don't remember all of it. So Daniel 8, 13 to 14. Yeah, Daniel chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one that spoke, For how long is this vision concerning the continually continual offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of both the sanctuary and the host of the people to be trampled underfoot? And he said to him and to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed and restored. Okay. You talked about 2,000 evenings and mornings or 2,000 days. The way Miller interpreted that is a day was 1,000 years. And that's, you know, I think there's another place where it says, For God, one day is like 1,000 years. So this is... He took that and took the other verse and came up with each day is a thousand years. And by his figuring, that should have been 1844. I'm not going to argue the math. <laughs> but whatever it was, he didn't come back, so it didn't work. Um, as they studied, though, the group that would become Seventh-day Adventist decided that actually Miller was right that Christ did, quote, return October the 22nd, 1844, but the return was not to earth. This is one of their foundational beliefs. According to their belief system, in 1844, Christ went to the holy place of heaven. I'm not sure what that means, but that's what they called it. And as he went in there, he began and I do this in quotation marks, his investigative judgment of his followers to see who was worthy to go to heaven. That belief became the foundation of the founders of Seventh-day Adventist. And um, 
Bed, you mentioned one of them when we were talking on Sunday. Mm -hmm. The founders are said to be James and Ellen White and Joseph Bates. And they were the leaders of the group that broke off from Miller, that took the belief that Jesus came back to the holy place of heaven in October 1844. And that's kind of one of the basic tenets of yeah. Seventh-day Adventist faith. They are really big on the writings of Ellen G. White. Yeah, we'll get to her in a minute. Yeah, she's, really she is big. a very prolific writer. Uh, the religion itself, the church itself, was incorporated in 1863 in Michigan, and its headquarters is located today in Silver Spring, Maryland. So, as Bev said, the church itself is really big on the writings of Ellen White. In fact, their religion has over 600 titles written by her that forms the real basis for their belief system. Uh, the writings include such, th such books as The Desire of Ages and The Great Controversy, and they had even paraphrased edition of the Bible, which they called the Clear Word. They view the Bible as the inspired Word of God, but they interpret it through their lens. So the modern translation, if you will, the paraphrase, takes into account their, trans their belief system when they translate the Bible. And we're going to find the same thing. I just did Jehovah's Witnesses this afternoon. And they have the same thing. They have their own Bible, which is just basically a paraphrase of the Protestant Bible, but it's done with word changes that make it support their beliefs. So it's, a, in my opinion, a corrupted version of the Bible. But it's what they use. Uh, other writings include such things as the Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, the Bible Commentary, and a lot of other different writings. But basically, their guide is the, uh, the Bible as translated by, as paraphrased by, the Seventh-day Adventist and the writings of Ellen White, who they view as a prophet in their church. She is extremely revered in the church. If you look at all, you'll see all kinds of stuff by her. So what do they believe about God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit? Well, first of all, like Christianity, they believe that God is the sole creator of the world and the universe, and he's Lord of all. They now believe that there is a trinity, and God is composed of a unity of three co-eternal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They believe that they are one in motive and purpose, but not in substance. And I'm sorry, I really don't know what that means. The source I was looking at, that's the way they quoted it. They believe in three parts to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in motive and purpose, not in substance, and then they say it's similar to the Trinity. So I'm not real sure what they mean by not in substance. I didn't find a definitive answer on that one. They see God's law as being embodied in the Ten Commandments. That's another one of their foundational doctrines, one of those 24 28 trans, uh, foundational doctrines. And they view God the Father, this will get you in a minute, God the Father to a seven-day Adventist possesses a physical body. So we believe God being a spirit, for a seven-day Adventist, he's got a physical body, which gives you the idea that, A, he's not omnipresent, because he's got one body, and you know, you can go on from there. None of the things that we believe as Christians, as Baptists, would be totally opposite of what they believe. Jesus is the eternal Son incarnate. He's fully God and fully human. Good so far. According to Ellen White, their prophet, God the Father exalted Jesus to be his son. And when he did that, he provoked his other son. Lucifer into rebellion and there was a war in heaven and Lucifer and the angels that followed him were thrown out When Jesus came to earth, they do not talk about a virgin birth When Jesus came to earth as a person, he was the proof that man can live a sinless life They accept his virgin birth his life death resurrection ascension 
If you ask them just basic questions about those, they will nod their head and say yes. Except Jesus' death on the cross was not a complete atonement for sin. When he died, he went to heaven, and he went into the heavenly places, quotes, where he prays for the sins of mankind until 1844, when he went into the holy place, at which point he's doing investigative judgment to see which one of humans are um, worthy of going to heaven with him. So you see, they take parts of what Christianity believes and then they kind of bend it to their own um, beliefs. Jesus is going to return visibly to earth after a time of distress and calamity on earth. And the test of whether or not you are a true Christian is whether or not you worship on Saturday or not. That comes into the seventh day part. So if you don't worship on, seven, on the seventh day, on Saturday, you are not going to be a true Christian when Jesus comes back at the second advent and tests you. It's really you fail the test. It's really Friday night at sundown. Yeah. Saturday. It's the same as the Jewish Sabbath. Uh -huh. It's Friday night to Saturday night. Well, back in the old days, in my hometown, Stanbury, Missouri, there was a seminary, and it's probably still there, for Seventh-day Adventists. They are, in my town, they were the, just about the cleanest living people. Oh, they are. We'll get to that in a minute. But oh. Yeah, they, they are <laughs> unbelievably, if you wanted somebody for a neighbor, you want Seventh-day Adventists for a neighbor. They are very clean. Holy Spirit is not exactly like we think of it. They do acknowledge the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, so they do believe in a trinity. But the Holy Spirit is not a personality. The Holy Spirit is simply a force or power from God. So what about salvation? Well, they believe that to be saved, you must first repent good so far, then believe that Jesus is our example and substitute, okay, good so far, and that by grace a believer is made right with God. The change comes is that when you're saved in order to maintain your salvation, you got to keep all of the commandments and rules of the seven-day Adventist. So you're saved by grace, but you keep your grace by following all the rules. Those found obedient in the end, and who are Seventh-day Adventists worshiping on Saturday, when the second coming occurs, they will get to go to heaven with Jesus. The fact that you worship on Saturday is the seal that says you're the right religion. You're the right brand of Christianity. Worshiping on Sunday is a sign of the beast. Okay, another foundational doctrine. God does not punish evil people eternally. If you do not accept Seventh-day Adventist or you don't accept Jesus as the atonement, you're not punished eternally. You are annihilated. You just cease to exist. So, you know, I guess he looks at you and you melt down to the ashes or something, but you are gone. In the end, Satan will be cast into the lake of fire and that's the Substitute for the sins of mankind who have believed that Jesus is the substitute and followed Jehovah Witness doctrines. Uh, humans do not have souls. That's a, another foundational doctrine. They are indivisible, mind, body, and spirit. When you die, you go to sleep because you're waiting for the resurrection. At Jesus' return, the righteous will be raised to life and after a thousand years, the wicked will be cast with Satan and Lucifer and his angels into the lake of fire. And if you're not a Seventh-day Adventist and you worship on Sunday, you're going to join them. That's basically what the belief is. But aren't they a pile of ash before then? Uh, that's after the resurrection. The throwing them into the last left can't talk. Throwing them into the lake of fire is what annihilates them. Okay, Seventh-day Adventists are probably best known for worshiping on Saturday, and it's 
Zeta said their Saturday is Not Sunday Saturday. or uh, Friday sundown to Sunday, Saturday sundown. Very similar to Judaism. They do not do any secular work on the Sabbath. Their idea of rest on the Sabbath is to go to church and then maybe spend time with family, doing family things, but no, no work of any type. No, but you can go out to dinner and let somebody else work. Yeah, you can let somebody else work, but you can't work. Uh, when they go to church, they worship on Saturdays. Yep. They go to a age-appropriate Bible class and then they all get together for corporate worship. And in corporate worship, they have scripture readings, prayers, singing, preaching, and collecting the tithes. So they collect money. Now, the interesting thing is the church doesn't keep the tithes. The monies that they collect goes to a regional office, which oh. then redistributes them out to churches and missions as needed. And I do as needed in quotes. I'm not sure what as needed means. But you don't get to keep the money you collect. It goes to a regional office and they redistribute it out again. But, you know, worship service sounds very similar to what you'd find in a Baptist church. I mean, we have a small group time. And then you have singing and prayer and scripture reading and preaching. So we'd probably be right at home in a, a worship service with them. Except we probably wouldn't understand their, their message. Um, four times a year, they do the Lord's Supper. They do it quarterly, but they do it in conjunction with a ritualistic push washing. Mm -hmm. The belief is that if you wash the feet before the Lord's Supper, it shows your humbleness in spirit, which is what Jesus did before the original Last Supper. He washed his disciples' feet. So they follow the same format. For them, baptism is by immersion and is a symbolic act just like for us. You know, it represents his death, burial, and resurrection. The churches are led by a pastor appointed by that regional office, so they don't call their own pastor. They have deacons and elders. The elders are responsible to assist the pastor in ministry, and the deacons are, are responsible for maintaining church property, and they have some responsibilities in worship services. They considered themselves to be God's one and only special revenant church. If you don't worship on Saturday, and you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, you're going you're to the lake of fire. That's basically it. And today that sounds pretty good. I'm cold. <laughs> it's cold out there. <laughs> it's not that cold. Now, uh, <laughs> Zeta, you or Esther once said something about, oh, you, you said it, Zeta, about how neat and clean the people were. They are very, very health conscious. Seventh-day Adventists believe in observing all of the Old Testament laws dealing with clean and unclean meat. And in fact, they advocate for vegetarianism. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually have, uh, I think it's in Australia, they actually have a health food company that they run. They very much believe in healthy living. They advocate for the abstinence of drugs, alcohol, tobacco, and caffeine. Not that dissimilar to some other uh, groups that we know of. They do not believe that homosexuality is an appropriate expression of biblically permitted intimacy, and they do not support abortion. Sounds like somebody you want for your neighbor, right? Healthy living, no drugs, no alcohol, so forth. Nice people. Um, they also believe that wearing jewelry is a sin. So if you got a necklace on, you're a sinner. And they do have, they do run a series of, the source called them proselyting programs, but basically they're evangelical. They want to bring people into their religion. And they also run health seminars, which you go to the health seminar and then you get a little bit of the religion as well to kind of bring you in. And that's all I had from Seventh Day Adventist. So Bev, you were nodding your head. You told me Sunday you had some I was friends. raised in that church and you told me a lot of things I didn't know. I always thought they were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> was I what you remember? Was I pretty much owned? Yeah, pretty much. I mean there was a lot of that stuff you were going through. This is what then I'm thinking, oh I didn't know that. But 
and the governing body is the conference. There's a conference, mm -hmm. and that's who calls the ministers, and that's who decides on the pay and divides up the money. And they move the ministers every, I don't know, three years, five years, so nobody gets too strong. Mm -hmm. So watch out for your job, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be watching. <laughs> He doesn't know I'm crazy yet. But it's just, uh, He'll learn. <laughs> he probably does. I came in and dropped my Bible. I was in the Dorset in Korea. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, they're and really neat people. I've got a lot of family members that are still Seventh-day Adventists, and they're great people. I love them dearly. They're a lot of fun. We just don't agree. Mm -hmm. I don't argue with them on the Saturday. I don't have a problem with going to church on Saturday. It's you know, it's, it's interesting. There are right. a number of, well, we've done Mormonism. Yeah. And we've done now seven day Adventist. Right. And when you think about their personal habits, mm -hmm. they are really nice people. They are. I, They're very nice people. Number of friends that have been Mormons and they are the nicest people you could could want to know. And these I've never had a seven day Adventist friend, but just thinking about what they say here, they would be very nice people to have for friends. We just would never get along as far as religion is concerned because we do not even come I close know. to seeing eye to eye. Yeah, my, my cousin that's the minister, uh, we, he knows I'm a Baptist. He knows I don't believe their way, and we have a truce. <laughs> I respect their religion, and they respect mine, and we do not. I don't know how else to do it because you can't get together as a family and have knock-down drag-outs over religion. I mean, I just don't agree with them. Mm -hmm. To me, Seventh-day Adventists were always, they, you can't do this religion. Mm -hmm. They were always what? You can't do this. I mean, that was that was all I ever heard was, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do this. You can't wear makeup. You can't shave your legs. They didn't. Sh women didn't shave their underarms. I mean, it was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Actually, see, I have a whole different perspective from where I grew up. Because I didn't know, I didn't know half of that stuff you were saying. I didn't either until I started studying. But the, the only MD in town was a Seventh-day Adventist, and we were glad to have an MD in the little bitty town, mm -hmm. I'll tell you that. Oh, we can't hear you. You've I got, said... You've got a mask on. We, you, I said the MD in, our, in my t growing up town was a uh -oh. Seventh-day Adventist, yeah. and we were so glad to have an MD in a little bitty town. Right. The one thing that my uh, parents always respected about them was that um, followers of God are supposed to live set apart lives, mm -hmm. and they honestly did. Definitely, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. With all the do nots, they were definitely set apart and different than their neighbors. Well, I never, I, you know, I never felt they were trying to get anybody from Stanford Baptist Church to come to their church. Mm -hmm. never. See, I just had a different view. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I mean, I didn't have that problem, but it, I was taken and dropped off in front of that church and had to go to Sunday school. I was having Sunday school every week because by that time my parents were not active. But that was the only church you could go to because if you didn't go to that one, you would burn it down. <laughs> okay, now I'm sorry. Well, that's, that's what they believe. And that's what I was left with. And I, therefore, I mean, I can't. I think it's great. I mean, I respect them the people that live that way, but I, that's not what I believe. Well, for me, me, they're bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's, my, that's my view on religion. That's why I'm a Baptist teacher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, James. No, this kind of I, I'm glad we're getting a chance to talk about it, but well, usually it's just me talking, so. <laughs> it's just, yeah, I'm praying. It's still they're just different. different. They're well, very different. It and, might have even sounds like some of the Jewish practices of the Old Testament where they would put a fence around all of the laws, around all of the laws to make sure that they didn't break the core law, it sounded like. Mm -hmm. That's very much what it is. They have their core uh, beliefs and then they, as you said, have basically built a wall around it and how to make sure you meet those core beliefs by not eating meat, by being vegetarians, by doing this, whatever. There were lots of rules. Yeah, lots of rules. I guess that's why you never saw an overweight one. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's overweight ones. <laughs> I'm not going to go there, Zita. <laughs> My 
my cousin that's the minister, he's really awesome. <laughs> he makes me look like Twiggy. <laughs> but I love him to death. He's okay. great. Any questions, comments on Seven Day Adventist? Now, I have a really tough question for you. We've been doing this now for about eight or nine weeks. Do you find it helpful? I find it interesting. Interesting? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll take interesting. I missed the, the witchcraft one last week, and I haven't gotten Jewish. I missed the first one, so i got to go catch them. you got to go catch them. Online. But yeah. The other go, go catch the witchcraft one. That's an interesting Yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. I did a similar study at my last church. The only difference was the book we used was about this thick. Well, <laughs> it's about this thick. I just use three books of different sizes because <laughs> there's a lot of duplication in them. Well, our pastor there taught the class, mm -hmm. and that is the only man I ever knew that could sit there and preach on one sentence of the Bible and go over his entire family. <laughs> <laughs> he brought in a lot of side scriptures, I hope. Brought in a lot of side scriptures. <laughs> okay, so next week we go from Seventh Day Adventist to Church of Christ Scientist, or more normally known as Christian Science. With there's some actually some similarities between the two, and there's some similarities actually between the two of them and Jehovah Witnesses. There, they all kind of came out of this same religious fever of the mid 1800s. In one way or another, they're kind of people were ups, um, upset and disputing traditional Christian beliefs of the time, and a lot of different groups came out of it. So, Seventh Day Adventist, Christian Science, and Jehovah Witnesses are all kind of splinter groups that came out of this time period. What about the Mormons? Did they come out of it too, or no? Mormons came out actually a little bit earlier than that. Okay. I don't remember the, the days. I Mormons remember. came out, I want to say 1820s, I think is when, uh, what's his name, Joseph Smith right. uh, did his translation. I'm, I'm doing that from memory, Bev, so don't hold me. But yeah, well, I'm thinking I, I mean, and I know we've already had the Mormons. I think it's today, eight, 1820s, I, I want to say. Is a, if he came up and broke off of that. Yeah. Yeah, let me look real quick, but I think that was an earlier time. Yeah, eight, 1830. Was I, was, I, I think it's interesting to learn something about what sets up the other religions of the world. Have you ever read the Book of Mormon? No. no. It is something akin to reading Leviticus over and over and over. Lots of rules. <laughs> and then the That's not I good. You're rolling on the floor laughing because you don't understand how people could believe something like this. Yeah. Now, let's close for tonight so people can get home before the snow comes. <laughs> Janice said we're going to have 14 inches of snow, so let's no, get... I got naked toes. I don't want snow. Of snow. Of snow. If the temperature gets down to around 32... They so we're going to get home before the snow starts. But that's an S word. We're not going to use that in church. <laughs> the S word? Oh, it's a four letter word, too. Mm. Yeah, the pastor's here. Oh, no. <laughs> Can I get no, he's out of good uh, Okay. Bev, would you close us in prayer? If you, if you can quit giggling. He likes us to be happy. I know it. You told me that at dinner. <laughs> Esther, be quiet. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this evening where we can get together with Christian friends and study religions, study different beliefs, discuss our own, be with each person here and meet their needs. Guide us through tomorrow. Help us to be better Christians and to be lights to the lost world. Help us to know what to say and when not to say anything. Lord, we thank you for our new pastor. We thank you for his, hope you'll make his move of 
smooth sailing for him and his wife and be with uh, James as he prepares our lessons again we appreciate so much his hard work and all he does for each and for each of us to bring us closer to you we ask these things in Christ's holy name amen